The item 7B, Commission General Regulation 478, Bighorn, Sheep, U, and Mountain Goat, online course, LCB file number R151-18, Game Division Administrator Brian Wakeling. The Commission will hold a workshop to consider a regulation relating to amending Chapter 502 of the Nevada Administrative Code. This regulation would require all Bighorn U and Mountain Goat tag holders to complete an online course. It would also require the tag holder for ram, bighorn sheep, mountain goat, mountain lion, or bear to provide questionnaire information during the already required post-harvest physical inspection and eliminate the subsequent need for successful tag holders to also submit a questionnaire. Mr. Wakeland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Kind of the impetus for this particular um, suggestion to uh, revise uh, our NAC, um, we have been, uh, it, uh, since we've initiated the uh, um, U hunts, um, we have had a, f a few people, um, a few hunters, and it tends to be rare, uh, but uh, typically we'll have maybe one or two hunters a year that mistakenly take a yearling ram while they're hunting a ewe. Um, it's a fairly easy mistake to make if you're not uh, familiar with, um, you know, intimately familiar with the, um, the looks, the behavior, and uh, bighorn sheep just in general. And so we've been trying to figure out a way that we might be able to improve compliance. Like I say, it, it's rare, um, but, uh, but we thought there was a way that we might be able to improve that and, uh, and increase compliance. Um, it's embarrassing for the hunter. Um, it's, it's not fun for the enforcement officer when he has to deal with it. Um, and so uh, we were looking for ways to do, do something. And so we were, we, as we discussed it, we thought there, there's an opportunity um, to just simply, especially with the advent of a new license vendor, um, we now have the opportunity to place a requirement that a, uh, a potential hunter, um, once they draw a tag, uh, would have to uh, simply log on. They could do it at any day, time of the day or night, uh, get on a computer, watch the video uh, or the online course, and would be far better educated. Um, I've really been impressed with the, uh, the, the seminar that uh, Mike Cox put together on bighorn sheep identification. I studied bighorn sheep uh, for, as part of my master's research. Um, it was something that I've been familiar with for, for years, and when I looked at that for the first time, I learned things that I didn't realize, uh, real easy ways to distinguish uh, ewes from young rams. Um, so we thought we have a really good tool um, but we need a way to make people watch it. Um, one of the concerns we have any time we implement something that we call a mandatory um, or require people to do something is that there's a chance that by creating this mandatory um, requirement, uh, we wind up um, possibly turning a, uh, a hunter away. It's a barrier. Uh, it, it's something that doesn't play well with hunter recruitment and retention. And as we thought about it, we kind of came to the conclusion that bighorn sheep are not your starter species. You know, by the time you start hunting bighorn sheep, uh, you've probably hunted deer, you've probably hunted antelope, you've probably hunted some other species. Rarely is a bighorn sheep the, your introduction to hunting. And if it is, um, you're, you're probably getting started with uh, fairly sophisticated mentors uh, that are already fairly along the way. Um, currently, uh, we don't have any requirement uh, for sex when you're trying to harvest a mountain, a mountain goat. Um, it could be either. Uh, they're hard to distinguish. However, it is beneficial uh, from, our, from our standpoint that if we can encourage hunters to harvest the male, we have uh, less of an impact on the species. And so we, could, we also have the opportunity to provide the same training associated with uh, mountain goats and mountain goat hunters. Again, just as with bighorn sheep, mountain goats are not the starter species. It's not the species that people start hunting the first time uh, they decide to hunt. 
And again, uh, with our new vendor, our new um, online process, uh, we could make this very simple to uh, employ and act. And uh, if, uh, if we enacted this, uh, all a uh, hunter would have to do is log on, watch a short video um, and uh, training seminar, and uh, they would be better educated. Um, some of the comments that I've seen on this is that um, you know, this would be good for everybody to have access to, and there's no reason in the world we would restrict access to this training. Uh, it would be available to anybody that had an interest in it. Uh, it would just simply be required that, uh, that these hunters would actually have to watch it ahead of time. So um, the process would be we simply take the online course and then the tag would be issued. Um, the, uh, we're proposing this online seminar viewed at the hunter's convenience um, any time prior to the issuance. All they have to do is watch it. Our, our objective with this is simply to reduce errors and improve targeting uh, the harvest where, we, where it's not required. <clears throat> As we went on and discussed this a little further, um, we also uh, recognize currently uh, we have a, a mandatory physical inspection of the ewes, a physical check um, on the harvest of a ewe. Uh, with a bighorn sheep ram, um, we collect a, a variety of information. We're able to accurately age the animal, and ultimately we affix a seal to the animal uh, so that uh, you know, we, we can ensure that it, it's a lawfully harvested animal. We don't do that with, with ewes. Um, ewes are extremely difficult to age, uh, even if you've got them in hand without extracting a tooth. The age information really doesn't uh, yield that much towards the management of the species. <clears throat> and it's a, ultimately it's a resource demand on us, and this is a demand on the hunter to actually come in and do that. Um, for those reasons, um, we're proposing that as part of this package, uh, we would eliminate the mandatory physical inspection of a U for U hunters. Um, they still have to report the harvest. It's still still something they have to do. Uh, but coming in, and we're looking at about 140 uh, currently, um, that is a, a human resource demand on the agency. Uh, time when people have to be in the office, not in the field. And uh, it also reduces some burden on the hunters that actually harvest the animals. So that's part of the package. The third aspect <clears throat> uh, deals with um, kind of a broader uh, part of it. You know, some species we, we still require that, um, like the rams. Rams still would have to come in for a physical inspection. And each year we get confusion from hunters and and like I say, even though the uh, bighorn sheep hunters are not typically brand new to the, to the activity, oftentimes we'll get some confusion. You know, they'll think, well, I've already completed my, my harvest questionnaire. I, I was right there in your office. I, I filled out the, all the, asked all the information you asked, I answered, and I still have to fill out a questionnaire. And so sometimes there's some confusion. They, they don't uh, recognize that they have to do that. And that's true for some other species. Um, you know, we have uh, um, mountain goats again, black bears. Um, and so what currently we've got, with the increase in technology, we've got laptops, we've got tablets. Um, we're working on the ability to actually collect all of the information we would typically record during the, when they fill out the questionnaire, we'll fill it out in person and simplify things for the hunter. They don't have to worry about filling it out twice. And we've got the data right there. And so um, we're proposing to eliminate the need for any hunter that has a mandatory physical inspection where they have to check the animal with our, our officers or our, with our biologists. They don't have to fill out. It won't be a subsequent questionnaire. If they provide that information to us at the physical inspection, then it would also, that, that would satisfy their need. And so this simplifies things for the hunter, and it applies to bighorn sheep, mountain goats, uh, bears, and lions. Um, it removes that, that extra requirement. We're getting to see the animal in person, so we were able to collect it. If they don't harvest, um, then they would still have to fill out the uh, questionnaire online.
but if they're there, we'll capture all that information. So those are our proposals. That's what we tried to capture in the language that's before you. Um, and at this point, I'd be glad to answer any questions the commission may have. Any questions for Mr. Wakeling? Commissioner East. Thank you. Um, Mr. Wakeling, when do you see this taking effect? Can we get it into effect this year or will it have to be in? Next I'm year. sorry, I'm having a... When do you see it taking effect? Uh, this, um, if everything goes through, this would probably uh, become effective um, a, year, a year from now. So okay. not this fall. It would take effect in the fall of 2019. 2019. Okay. And probably not access to online is an issue, but do you have a solution for that if it is an issue? Someone says, I don't have access to a computer... I mean, we're doing everything online anyway. Their, their email account is their tag account, but is there a consideration for that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioner East, um, they have to use a computer to apply. Right. Um, so there are computers available, um, you know, virtually anywhere and everywhere. Um, you can go to a, a library and get access to it. Um, so. Um, but we don't sure. see that as a huge obstacle. Okay. Thank you. It, it, if it takes effect, I take it the successful applicants who draw the tags that require the course, they're going to be notified. You need to take the course, and once you complete the course, then you're going to get the tag. And that's the way it's going to work. Mr. Chairman, that's absolutely correct. It would be our intent to do everything we could to inform them ahead of time to include um, some notification when they're actually filling out the application. Any further questions for Mr. Wakeling? Mr. Wakeling, Mr. Wakeling um, how, how do you envision the uh, online course? Is it subsequent and then there'd be pictures presented that you would make the identification, yes or no, and you'd have a certain percentage correct, and if you got that percentage correct, you pass? Or uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Valentine, um, the actual course itself, um, what we currently have is a, uh, it's a uh, somewhat of a, like a narrated uh, um, PowerPoint presentation. And <clears throat> what it does, it walks through some of the physical aspects, you know, the, uh, you know, something as uh, simple as where the animal urinates from to um, probably some of the most um, informational thing is, is comparing the diameter of the horn at the base to the diameter of the eye. Um, there's some really diagnostic features that, that really assist um, in identifying uh, sex for something that at cursory look is really difficult to differentiate. Um, but we're not suggesting that this would be a, uh, uh, a course that you'd have to um, score above a certain amount or a pass-fail or anything like that. It would simply be an informational course. You just had to demonstrate that you actually spent the time um, watching it. Um, currently, there, there's no, uh, other than having to pass a uh, hunter, hunter education course, there is no other uh, certification that you have to pass. And uh, uh, currently, anybody can, can hunt uh, um, use if they draw that tag, and like I say, our our uh, the rate at which errors are made are extremely low. We just think that this will help us and provide. Uh, like I say, I I've studied bighorn sheep. I've I've worked with it. When I first saw this, I was astounded at at how how uh, useful the tool was at, at being able to help identify uh, the correct gender. I, I was just one, my only concern is I think the online training is great, especially after looking at the big horn sheep in the field the last commission meeting and t discussing the placement of the horns on the, on the um, first year um, young out and how difficult it is to spot that. But why, can we go through why we're only having the male big horn sheeps presented five days after kill? Because if we had continued to do female and male, wouldn't we be able to better assess whether that error is still occurring in the field? I mean, what if you have somebody who is, believes what they killed was a ewe and it's essentially a small male? 
and would they not bring that in then because they have a UTAG? I mean, if they were mandated to bring all of them in, then you would be catching the air. You might be missing information by just focusing in on one species. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Hubbs, um, very good question. Um, from, a, from an enforcement standpoint, if we require people to come for a physical inspection, we certainly have got a, a, a fully acknowledge we have a great opportunity uh, to be able to um, um, enforce our, our laws uh, better. I mean, it's, if someone comes in with something, we're able to physically inspect and do that. Absolutely correct. Um, however, our experience has been that most hunters, when they've made an error, they self-report. Um, if we have someone who makes an error and chooses not to report, they can currently come in and say, hey, I didn't harvest an animal. Or they can harvest a second one and bring that one in. Um, there's lots of ways for people to circumvent um, you know, our ability to detect compliance currently. Um, so we don't really feel like um, eliminating this uh, physical inspection is going to be a huge compliance challenge. I, we think we can still enforce um, compliance with that, enforce our laws um, without any trouble. Um, that it, basically what it boils down to is a balance between uh, the benefits versus the costs of conducting these physical inspections. The benefits of conducting the physical inspections on a ewe is substantially less than what it is for a male. So if we have a ram, because of the way the ram's horns grow, we get a much better idea. We're able to estimate uh, age structure a lot better. Um, we don't manage for a particular age structure within the ewe segment. Typically, when we have a ewe hunt, we, we have a population that's over objective and we're trying to reduce it or at least reduce its growth rate. And so the importance of trying to be able to characterize the age structure and the harvest for the female segment is far less important and our capability to do so is also far less, um, it's, a, it's a tougher thing to do than what it is for, for the males. Um, in addition, if we're looking at a particular area and we're looking to um, <clears throat> obtain biological specimens, for instance, if we think, for instance, there may be a, uh, a respiratory disease outbreak, we're still able to contact the hunters and request samples be submitted. Um, and, and so we're still able to get the, the information we need. This just allows us to reduce the burden on the hunter and it also reduces uh, the human resource commitment of the agency. Sometimes, I mean, if you were to uh, be in the parking lot of our Vegas office on the open, first day after the season's opened, sometimes you'll have lines of cars going out. And what we're really looking for is ways that we can reduce the number of lines that we have with our customers rather than trying to increase those needs. And so looking at this, this looks like one of the needs that, or one of the, one of the situations where we don't have a real need to do this, and so uh, we're proposing that we eliminate that physical inspection only for the use segment. Additional questions? This is a possible action item. Any public comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the commission. I know in the past we typically have these go through one or two rounds, right? Or should we feel free to go ahead and move forward? I think because it's a workshop on the first reading, we advance it for a second reading for possible adoption at the September meeting in Las Vegas. Do we need a motion to do that? Put it on the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Wakeman. With that, we'll close that agenda item. And move on to agenda item 7C, Commission General Regulation 479, Rosie Boa Reptile, LCB file number 
152-18, Wildlife Diversity Administrator Jennifer Newmark and Wildlife Diversity Biologist Jason Jones. The Commission will hold a workshop to consider amending Chapter 503 of the Nevada Administrative Code. This amendment would revise the scientific name of the rosy boa, which is classified as a protected reptile from I didn't take Latin, so I'll do my best. Licanura trivergata to Licanura orcuti. This name change is needed due to scientific studies that have split the species into two distinct entities, one that occurs in Nevada and one that occurs outside of the state. Current NAC protects the species outside Nevada rather than the species that occurs within Nevada. Ms. Newmark, Mr. Jones. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Newmark. I'm the Wildlife uh, Diversity Division Administrator for Nevada Department of Wildlife. Um, this agenda item will just be updating the scientific name of the rosy boa to reflect the current taxonomy as well as um, the species that occurs in Nevada. Um, our state herpetologist, J Jason Jones, will have a presentation just to provide you with some background information and show you some of the map changes and range changes. So we'll get that going in just a second. Thank you. Well, thanks, Commission, for uh, having me once again. Um, it's always an honor for me to come here and talk about something I, I really am fond of, which is reptiles. Hopefully I don't have to do like a hand-drawn presentation. No, but we would like um, the appropriate scientific pronunciations. So. That was really close. I commend you on that. It's, it's Lichinura trivergata, Scott, and Lichinura orcutti, for those who are taking notes. All right, so the rosy boa is one of uh, only two species of boa uh, native to the contiguous or continental United States. Uh, the other boa, which some of you may be familiar with, is the rubber boa. Um, and what's yet another thing that's cool about Nevada is that we have both species that have been described in our state. So uh, the question today is, is a rose by any other name still a rosy boa? Um, so, to take you back 150 years, um, Edward Drinker Cope, uh, somewhere along the Baja Peninsula, first described uh, what is considered Lichinura trivergata. Uh, years later, um, Leonhard, uh, I can't pronounce his last name, uh, Stegnegger, um, described outside of San Diego, in San Diego County, um, what we now know as the Rosy Boa. So for over a hundred years, and these are the these are the two examples of those species. So for over a hundred years, um, we've kind of considered them somewhere between two different species, or um, more recently, the same species. And um, if you'll just note on the right hand side there, um, the variability in their morphology, meaning patterns, colorations, scale counts, um, is is pretty wide as is their range. So you see from central California all the way down through southern California into the Baja Peninsula, uh, the rosy boa occurs. And then it also occurs stretching eastward all the way into western Arizona down into um, the coast of Sonora, Mexico. So they're a very wide ranging and very diverse species. And so much so that uh, not only scientists but also enthusiasts uh, have, have kind of delineated different subspecies or forms. And this has happened since the early 1900s. And so um, you'll notice that there's a lot of, uh, I've got little stars there to just depict these different forms. Um, three that are potentially mo most meaningful. And so you can see here that uh, there's a lot of variability, not only within these populations, but between populations. 
And so as you go further north, up top there, that little six-panel um, uh, photo mosaic, you'll see that um, what we consider the desert form uh, typically has stripes that are anywhere from rosy uh, to peach colored um, to tan, uh, brick red even, and then with a background color of, of light tan, beige, cream, or even white. Now as you go all the way down to Mexico, uh, you'll notice the bottom panel there, you have um, three lines on those on those particular individuals from that population or those populations. And that's typically um, chocolate brown to black with a, a background color of white to light tan. And this is important, um, as you'll see as I, as I continue to go along. Now, that middle section is actually what you consider the peninsular or coastal area of um, Baja and Southern California. And that's where things kind of get a little blurry. But you'll notice that um, you lose some of the striping and some of the individuals. That background color is darker. Um, so there are distinct differences between these, what was once considered subspecies or forms. So this right here depicts all these dots are from Wood et al. Now, Dustin Wood works for the United States Geological Survey in San Diego. Um, he and colleagues took a lot of samples from a variety of different locations throughout the species range. And through molecular techniques, determined that, in fact, there are two species. So going all the way back to uh, 1800s, where they described the two species, um, they kind of conferred that based on the morphology, color, patterns, um, and also the scale counts, that the genetics match up. And so you see in the little inset I put it there, um, there are actually two different lineages. Um, and so these guys have essentially elevated it to two different species. Um, these old timers would probably say, duh, um, because they first described them as two different species. Um, however, it took a lot of genetics to kind of reveal that that was in fact the case. So based on the photo vouchers and live specimens uh, collected here in Nevada, um, it would make sense that ours looks just like or closer to uh, the, a neighboring population, which would be the Wallapai Mountains in Arizona. And in fact, that does. That's the uh, top photo there is from the Wallapai Mountains whereas the middle photo um, depicts the two photo vouchers from specimens collected around Christmas Tree Pass. And so you can, just, you can see visually right there um, that they're distinguishable from the, uh, their Mexican counterparts or Southern Arizona counterparts, uh, which is now considered the three-line boa. So what we did was we sent out a questionnaire uh, to 10 small businesses that specialize in reptiles, uh, so pet shops. Uh, one business did not reply. Three uh, said that this would have no impact in terms of our proposed regula uh, regulatory change. Uh, one actually noted that it wouldn't have an impact on them, but they thought it was a positive change. Um, overwhelmingly, the six that did reply, um, all of them said it would have a positive impact. Essentially, that they'd be able to sell the non-native species, uh, Lichinura trivergata, uh, the three-line boa, and that there is a growing interest in this species. And so to kind of sum this up, um, our proposed change is very simple. Um, update the rosy boa's scientific name to Lichinura or Kadai to reflect the most updated scientific literature. And that would therefore allow um, people to potentially have the non-native um, three-line boa, which currently in our statute we protect based on the scientific name. And, uh, Something worth noting is that uh, this commonly happens, um, especially for reptile, amphibian, and fish populations, where um, thanks to growing genetic techniques, we're able to really discern different um, populations as actually different species. Um, in many cases, they will change species names, um, sometimes multiple times within decades. Um, so this is a, just an example of, of something we, we kind of face with frequency. But with that, I'll take any questions. Any questions from the commission? Commissioner East. Jason, um, thank you for that. I learned a lot about snakes that I didn't know about. Um, <laughs> is there any place that you need to notify? I'm just curious that we've made this change. Is there like, like some authority or, or another department? or? In terms of like in Nevada? outside of Nevada? Uh, no, so um, we use what's called the, the uh, 
Society for Scientific, sorry, um, SSAR, the <laughs> Society for the Study of Amphibians and Reptiles, and they okay. come out with an annual, uh, or not annual, but every few years they come out with a revised changes in terms of um, common and scientific names. And so that's what we essentially try to reflect, not only in our, in our own work, but hopefully through code, um, is essentially trying to reflect what the scientific community kind of accepts. And it's a committee. Similarly, we, we just discussed this, um, ornithologists, um, bird folks, um, mammologists, a variety of different groups actually typically have some sort of committee where based on genetics or most recent studies, uh, they will change, change names. Any additional questions? Just um, going back to um, a lot of the commercial aspects of, the, of our reptilian species and um, what was of interest to me in, in this, and you may have mentioned it in the beginning and maybe I overlooked that point, but um, I guess my only concern would be if there's an interest to bring the um, lower, the other species into the state, are we feeding something? Like what is the status of the secondary species that is down in actually another country in certain aspects of how are its population numbers doing and, and are those species as protected and are we actually in fact harming something if we're commercializing trade and bringing it into the state of Nevada? That's a great question, Commissioner Hubbs. Um, so in Arizona and California, you can collect those. Um, both Arizona and California require you have a valid hunting license to collect reptiles. Um, so you can collect them. Um, Mexico, I'm not entirely sure, but I'm just given how many um, different populations are in the pet trade, my guess is that it's legal to collect them as well in Mexico. Um, and the populations seem to be doing well in California and um, Arizona, um, but it, it is a good concern. Um, the nice thing is from a law enforcement perspective, as you guys hopefully could see, there are differences that you can distinguish just based on the naked eye. Um, but um, the question was also raised, like what happens if they release in the wild? Um, my guess is, given the fact that you have a more music environment down in the Baja Peninsula and Southern and the coastal California area, um, those likely would not last. And so um, endangering our native rosy boa species is unlikely by introduction of, of what we can now consider the non-native species. Um, but it's always a concern. And I also should note that we currently are kind of wrangling a lot of pet shops who, because it is such a popular pet trade animal, uh, we routinely go to pet shops in the Vegas area. Um, we knock on their door, I play good cop, law enforcement gets to play bad cop, and we try to kill them with education, so to speak. We try to give them a lot of information on our NACs and point out what's illegal, and this continues to be something that pops up. And so that's, so with the name change, a lot of pet shops have been um, big advocates of this because it's already an animal in the trade. Um, many of them are captive bred, um, but without a doubt, I'm sure some are wild caught. So, yeah, it's kind of a roundabout to your question, but hopefully that addresses it. Additional questions? Any public comment? Just want to thank you, Jason. Your enthusiasm and passion for reptiles is contagious and I always I, I, uh, I always really truly uh, look forward to when you come to the commission meetings uh, I learn something new and uh, I really I, I say that in the, the utmost sincerity I really do like it and uh, learn something new and so with that I don't think and before we move on I will say when you went to your picture with the pain someone on call Park Commissioner East out a little bit. She had the biggest shiver you've ever seen over here. It shook the whole table. So, so you got her attention too. I'd say. I was tempted <laughs> to put a rosy boa under all of your seats, like Oprah Winfrey would, um, <laughs> but I opted out of that because they are prohibited currently. So I, I couldn't so, do that. So my visual of rosy boa, <laughs> I'm going to share this, is that she has big eyelashes and pink lips and rosy cheeks. So. <laughs> I, I tried to endear myself to, to it. <laughs> Thanks. So with this being um, the workshop, uh, I don't think we need to take any action. I'll come back for a second reading at the September meeting in Las Vegas. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to agenda item number eight, Commission Regulation 
19-12, amendment number one, 2018-2019 Upland game and fur bearer seasons and bag limits. I believe uh, that'll be game division administrator Brian Wakeling rather than wildlife staff specialist Sean Espinoza. The commission will consider taking action to amend the season for upland game birds for the 2018 and 2019 season. The amendment recommends an adjustment to the open units for sage grouse hunting due to the effects of wildfire on habitat. Mr. Wakeling. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Um, at your June meeting, uh, you just recently approved um, CR 1812 that included all upland game and fur bearers. Uh, since that time, and um, you know, Mr. Gen Alan Janae uh, provided a briefing this morning on some of the fires that have occurred uh, this year already. Um, some of those fires, and one in particular, the Martin fire, um, has already had a, a pretty substantive effect on what we think will occur over the course of the, the next year. Uh, consequently, we thought it was prudent to come to before the commission and request an amendment to that CR at this point in time and uh, request that we close the season for sage grouse in uh, essentially in units 051 and 066. Uh, the rest of the, uh, the units that we had proposed seasons in, we, um, we don't see any reason to modify any of those seasons. They all seem to be doing uh, as projected, we haven't had uh, large catastrophic fires there. Um, it's important to consider um, kind of the cumulative effects that we have with these fires, uh, not only the Martin fire, uh, which uh, is again, as uh, Mr. Alan Janae pointed out this morning, 218,000 acres this year. Uh, last year, the snowstorm fire also within that same area um, within unit 066, it burned about 171,000 acres. Uh, so between the two of them, we're approaching 4,000 acres. Uh, currently, um, our best estimates is that there are only nine active leks that aren't going to be influenced in some way by these fires. Um, for those reasons, we're proposing that we close those two seasons and amend uh, CR 1812 uh, in that fashion. Thank you, Mr. Wakeman. Um I just want to... I, I did receive some correspondence or telephone calls on this particular agenda item. And w one was from a friend of mine who has a hunting cabin in Midas, question being whether or not the whole unit of 066 needed to be closed, that there were some areas unaffected by fire, that perhaps you could limit it to that area or reduce the season to one weekend or limit the take. Um, got a second call from another friend Part of the same family uh, suggesting the same. Got a third call from a member of the same family, um, <laughs> Brian Elmore. Uh, and, and Brian, you know, I think was a Wayne E. Kirch Award winner, primarily, I think, because of a lot of the sage grouse work he had done up in that area. And uh, Brian's view was to no, give the birds a break, close the unit. It's unfortunate. Uh, and I did call um, Sean Espinoza. I just wanted to talk to Sean prior to the meeting. What, did he think it was an option? What was, you know, closing portions of the unit or limiting the season? And uh, Sean was very emphatic that um, from his perspective, when the fire occurred, the effects not really known at this point in time, that he did not like the idea of trying to scale back the season, uh, but he wanted the, the unit closed. So I just wanted to disclose that I had those conversations. The other two individuals I talked to were Rick Elmore and Darren Elmore, and their father and son and friends of mine. So that was the, I think I got contacted by the entire Elmore family. Um, in any event, uh, those were the communications I had. And I guess one of the concerns I had was if we closed a portion of 066, one, I don't think the birds would be in the burn area. They'd be in the area unaffected by the burn. That's where the hunters would go, and then you'd get a concentrator's concentration of hunters in that area, potentially. Then thinking if you limited it to one weekend and you limited the take, would that be an option? And so, in any event, uh, any questions? Um, I was concerned the last meeting when we um, 
there were certain areas where I was unsure of whether we should just close those areas as well. And he seemed, uh, Mr. Espinoza seemed to feel very confident with the decision making that was made at that commission meeting to leave it open. My concerns are this again, though. Looking at the Martin fire, it seemed to me that there was more than nine active LECs on that map. It was I, did you just say <coughs> nine were there? Because there were quite a few green dots on that map that was presented today. But then, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Hubs, thanks for pointing that out. I, I may have, uh, the way I presented that may have been misleading. There was only, to our understanding, there's only nine active LECs that did not get influenced in some way, shape, or form. Um, as Mr. Janae pointed out, um, I think when you add up the number of LECs that were influenced, either the ones that we know are there or uh, we believe were, are active and hadn't confirmed yet, I think the number that was influenced is far greater than that, about 30. It, it affected approximately 4% of the LECs statewide, probably close to, probably in excess of 75% of the LECs in that unit. So I was just thinking, since we can't, can't begin to understand what that might mean or how many species, birds, you know, individuals in and of themselves were able to outrun the 14 mile per hour fire over that distance. And the fact that we at times capture birds and give them to other states, is there any possibility that potentially we could um, move birds around the landscape? I know that area is burned and, and will be somewhat worthless for a while in terms of habitat, but are, are there other potential sites that could support um, sage grouse um, populations, like historical sites that haven't been looked at, and potentially we should be thinking about scaling back even more so we could augment and grow populations. I don't know, just a thought. I see Mr. Wasley reaching for the button. Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Hubbs, uh, just clarification on the number of LECs. There were at least 29 known active LECs that were destroyed, an additional 12 pending active LECs that were destroyed in the fire. So 41 that were either confirmed active or pending active uh, at, at a minimum, with many of those being 70 to 90 male LECs. Using the known ratio of males to females and knowing how many males attended those LECs, the approximate population estimate affected in that burn is 2,500 or 4% of the statewide population estimate. Oh, the challenge that we have isn't uh, addressing whether those birds were able to outrun or outfly the fire. It's having suitable habitat after the fire, suitable not only for strutting, but suitable for nesting and suitable for brood rearing. So, you know, the, your question, could we, could we repopulate that area? Certainly, um, we have to wait for habitat recovery. The question, are there other areas where we could take maybe some of those birds that have been affected by the loss of habitat of that fire and use those birds as a source population to repopulate other areas is all predicated on the assumption that there's suitable habitat elsewhere that doesn't already have birds, um, which isn't the case. Our problem with sage grouse is shrinking habitat, loss of habitat. It isn't that we have unoccupied habitat or habitat that's occupied below carrying capacity. Um, it's that we have either poor quality habitat or loss of habitat. And that poor quality habitat results in higher rates of predation, lower rates of recruitment, and a whole host of things. So at this point, if we were to take and capture any birds, um, the likelihood of success in repopulating any area would be extremely low. Our best bet is to do, as Mr. Janae indicated, and make turn what it has, has been the largest fire in Nevada's history into the largest restoration effort in Nevada's history with the hope that when some of those birds return to those leks to strut next spring and they're dancing in, in ash or remnants, um, that we can get some recovery so that we can hang on to some of those birds and the genetic variability that exists in those populations so that as that recovers, uh, we can have success in the future. So the, the hunting in other areas, I guess what I'm saying is doesn't, it's not, I know you have a word for it. We, you talk about it. It's not cu cumulative, like meaning. It's not additive. It, it's not additive. It's, it's exactly. compensatory, right? So you're you're just saying that even though there's been a four percent decrease, most likely, if if we're considering that to be a four percent statewide decrease because of the Martin type fires, with all of those lex lost, seems it seems like a lot to me. Yeah. So we don't know if it'll be a four percent decrease. I think the way that that we characterize that is that 4% of the state's population has been affected. The level of decrease um, 
we don't know, and that speaks to Mr. Espinoza's uh, concern. It's too early to tell what the effects will be. Uh, we don't know if some of those birds will be able to move into adjacent unburned areas, uh, if we'll see increased attendance on, on some of those leks. These birds have really high sight fidelity, which means they strut in the same area year after year. They nest, some of them will nest under the exact same sagebrush year after year. And so there's some disruption to their, their life cycle, their life history. All of a sudden, they're, uh, they've never experienced this before. So we have to see how they adjust, how the habitat adjusts, uh, how quickly things bounce back. But the other point that Mr. Espinoza made in, in talking about 4% of the state's population uh, may be affected by this fire is high, much higher than the percent of the population that we harvest annually, which is 2% or so. And so I know that it's counterintuitive for people to think, well, wait a minute, here's a, here's a species that was a candidate species for, for listing under the Endangered Species Act, where we just had maybe as much as 4% of the population affected by this fire, but yet we're going to go hump them? Uh, that, that makes no sense, because tangible mortality to us, it comes from hunting or predators. And so the, the, the emphasis is on, well, let's, let's curtail that mortality, let's stop hunting and, and, and kill predators. But the value in taking one, two percent, or even three percent of that population is the biological data that we get from it, because it tells us uh, what nest success is like. It tells us what brood size is like, uh, recruitment. So we get we get uh, reproductive characteristics that, that then we can tie to specific habitats. We can understand where we can manage them successfully, areas that we can protect, um, areas of you know preference by the birds. They show us what their preference is, and then we can try to recreate those habitat characteristics in other places. Absent that data. Um, that's been really instrumental in our sage grouse management program historically, uh, we'd, we'd be guessing a lot more than, than we do. So you talked about additive versus compensatory mortality. Hunting is largely viewed as compensatory, meaning that uh, there's only a set number of birds that the land can supply, whether they um, are killed by hunters or killed by predators, that number doesn't change. Additive would be that um, hunting kills additional birds than what the winter or predators or something else uh, would kill. But sage grouse hunting at the level that, that we hunt it using the WAFLA guidelines for uh, lek attendance and percent harvest of the population, um, the levels and the way that we manage hunting is, is not considered to be additive but compensatory. Well, that being said, I'm obviously on board with closing the areas. I just w wanted to know if there was more that needed to be done. But also in terms of timing, do we need to make that decision now? Because I think the hunts take place in September. Or? I, I believe the way this would work is that if we adopted the amendment, it would go in effect today. And I, I take it if it was to go into effect, the department is going <clears> to <throat> do some sort of public outreach to let people know that 066 is closed. And in I don't see that, uh, that the, the game wardens would, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I do have a concern. The season's out. We're not too far from it. Mr. And Mr. you could have an innocent person go out into 066 up in the unburned areas, right? Mr. And, Chairman, yeah. um, we have not yet printed the small game hunting guide, and we are holding that pending the outcome of, of this the commission's decision today. And if the commission chooses, regardless of which, which direction the commission chooses, their decision will be reflected in the printed guide. I guess my hope would be that there would be more effort than just the printed guide because there's individuals I know, they know the dates, they know the limitations, they're not going to check the guide, they're going to go out to their places and if they're not on top of everything this commission does, they could walk right into a closed unit and next thing you know they've got a problem. Absolutely. And, and it's not an intentional thing on their part. I understand it's the obligation of everybody to know the law and everything like that, but I do have, um, I want to make sure that if the <clears throat> amendment goes forward that, that, in fact, there is more of an effort to reach out to, to the public to let them know. Um, right, and it's area 051 as well. 051 as well, right, in addition to 066 on the next page.
Any further questions before I take it out to public comment? Public comment on CR 18-12, amendment number one. Seeing none, I, I believe all the CAB action reports, the CAB supported this. Uh, although I did not see, did we get an action report from Humboldt County? We did from Elko, and they were in support. I'll bring it back, with seeing no public comment, I'll bring it back to the commission. Commissioner um, McNinch. Go ahead. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I'll make a motion to approve CR 18-12 Amendment 1 uh, as uh, proposed by the department. I second that. I have a motion by Commissioner Mint McNinch to approve CR 18-12 Amendment number 1 as presented with a second by Commissioner Hubbs. Any further comment or discussion before I call for the vote? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? None. That motion carries unanimously 6-0 with Commissioners Barnes and Cavilia absent. With that, we'll move on to agenda item number nine, public, public comment period. Persons wishing to speak are requested to complete a speaker's card and present it to the recording secretary. No action may be take, can be taken by the commission at this time. Any item requiring commission action may be scheduled on a future commission agenda. Is there any public comment? Yes, come on. Good morning, I'm Maggie Orr. I am the vice chair of the Lincoln County Conservation District. I'm on the State Conservation Commission and I'm the current president of the Nevada Association of Conservation Districts. And um, conservation districts, they're entities of state government, in case you don't know. We're locally elected. We're part of the movement for um, locally led conservation in the state. We get our authority from NRS 548. And um, it state, NRS 548 states that CDs should be leaders in the conservation um, of the state of Nevada. And so Nevada Association of Conservation Districts is working to, um, for a way for CDs to step up um, into that role and do some of that leading within the state. So we have obtained funding to initiate resource needs assessments in seven CDs um, to start with. Lincoln County, White Pine, Mason Valley, Smith Valley, Northeast Elko, Eureka, and um, Conservation District of Southern Nevada. And um, we hope to all do 28 CDs before this process is all finished. We're using the NRCS farm planning system. And it looks like uh, where that, look, that process, if you're not familiar with it, and it's, it's long and complicated, I won't explain the whole thing, but it looks at resource concerns first before it adds in the human concerns. And that's why it's successful, is it does it in the, in the order that brings the best attention to what the resource concerns are. And it doesn't allow the human the human concerns to dominate. And I just wanted to read you what we see will be the benefits of this, um, both to the CD and to the local area after they complete one of these resource needs assessments. They will have the information to inform the NR Natural Resources Conservation Service State Technical Advisory Committee. They will have a plan in place to coordinate and cooperate with federal agency planning, both at the federal level, BLM and Forest Service is what we're thinking of, Fish and Wildlife Service. They will be able to direct funding from any source toward appropriate conservation projects. The information can assist a county with local planning to address local resource concerns. It creates a mechanism for a local work group to function and fulfill its responsibilities. And it will further partnerships begun by varied sage grouse efforts. It's all about having the information in place to make the best decisions at the local level about how best to spend any program dollars available from any source to solve resource concerns and how to locally lead planning for the future. This locally led planning process establishes a foundation upon which the district's conservation efforts are based. It provides the informational and scientific rigor for planning and project implementation that is on par with other federal planning processes and provides the context to develop collaborative solutions with state and federal partners. It challenges neighbors, both urban and rural, to work together, and this works across, this will be done on both private land and, and federally owned land. That, that's why it works together the best. And they can work together to take responsibility for addressing these local resource needs. It involves the community in the assessment of those needs, as well as the solutions and priorities. 
The approach emphasizes voluntary non-regulatory incentive-based actions before use of regulatory measures. It is not driven by any single piece of legislation, any one fiscal year, or any individual program. It's an ongoing timeless approach that is not tied to any particular year, and as such it is able to be evaluated regularly to ensure it's effectively meeting the long-term needs of the local community. So um, we've been working with Alan Janae, who is graciously making $10,000 available for a survey that's gonna be developed by UNR and UNCE, so it's a very sophisticated survey, and that will help us to get broad input across these CD areas. Um, I wanna make you aware, I just wanted today to make you aware of what we're doing. I wanted to encourage you and, and Endow to, in, to allow and encourage their staff and all the CABs to participate in this process so that we get the best wildlife input that there is so we can get the most benefit for the wildlife. And I'd also like to suggest that you involve the Paradise Sonoma and the Oahe Conservation Districts in your Martin Fire um, rehabilitation efforts because they could be an excellent partner there. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Orr. Any additional public comment? Mr. Hyatt. John Hyatt, <clears throat> Clark County Cab. At virtually every cab meeting, the question comes up, what's being done about mule deer? Mule deer, the most important big game animal in the state. What's the department doing about it? And what I would like to ask is, it would be very nice if a person from the department of biologists could come and basically just tell everybody what the status of mule deer is, what are the factors that affect mule deer population, where are we going with mule deer in terms of increasing aridity in the state, wildfire, destruction of habitat, and so on. I think people would really enjoy and appreciate a statement, fairly definitive statement from the department about what's going on with the mule deer population. Thank you. Any additional public comment? Seeing none, I'll close the agenda item, and we will, we're gonna break for lunch, and then there will be a, a commission tour. Um, do I need to read this point? Grant would have. Well, if Grant would have, then I guess I'll do it. <laughs> The commission will tour an area in southeast Nevada, I'm assuming Lincoln County, with wildlife significance. Informational presentations will be made at several sites, but no action will be taken by the commission. The public is invited to participate, but will be required to provide their transportation. The group will depart from the meeting location. I suspect that we would be departing around 12.15, 12.30. So everyone has a time to have lunch and so I, I certainly encourage uh, members of the public to go on the tour along with the commission and Dow staff. They are something that are very worthwhile, but often not attended by the public. But so, so back here at 12.30? Yeah, let's plan on leaving here at 12.30, and then we'll stand in recess until tomorrow morning at 8.30. I'm going to come again.